I will call this meeting to order. Um, we have quorum. Thank you so much, everyone. And roll call, please, Amy. Sure. Chair LaPlante. Here. Vice Chair Glossy. Member Rutledge. Here. Member Cobert. Here. Member Childress. Here. And Member you. Okay, thank you. I move to approve the minutes from our last Economic Development Hello. Committee meeting. Thank you. Sure. On Tuesday, April 18th. Um, may you, will you please call the roll? Absolutely. Thank Chair LaPlante. Aye. Vice Chair Glassy. Member Rutledge, yes. Member Coburn, Aye. Member Childress, yes. and Member You. Wonderful, thank you, that passes. Um, for my chair remarks, just I'm happy to welcome Lisa Shabbat and Teresa O'Brien um, to be our presenters today. Um, we're going to hear an update on work that do page from Lisa, a summary of the new program year allocations, and Teresa is going to give us uh, an update from Choose to Page and an overview of the wonderful breakfast that we had last week, the week before, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, time is a flat circle, but <laughs> it was recent and it was wonderful and we're going to get an update. So thanks. So that's all I have to say about that. Do we have any public comments? We do not. Okay, oh, wonderful. Okay, um, I move to receive and place on file item 6A, 23-2162, GPN 31-23. It's a Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act statewide rapid response grant, Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, U.S. Department of Labor, $500,000. This is through Human Resources Workforce Development Division. So we have a, a motion, do we have a second? Oh yes, you did, okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, and that all in favor? Aye. Aye. Wonderful. That is placed on file. We have a change order, item 7A, ED CO 223, amendment to purchase order 6161, serve, issued to Dell Marketing LP for an increase to the existing service level Microsoft Office 365 government licensee. For, for Workforce Development Division for an increase of $13,905.50 for a new contract total of $51,026.29. So moved. Second. Thank you. Um, would you please call the roll, Amy? Yes. Chair LaPlan? Aye. Vice Chair Glassy? Aye. Member Rutledge? Aye. Member Coburn? Aye. Member Childress? Yes. And member you. Okay, that passes. Thank you. We have a resolution. Item 8A FIR 0152-23, acceptance and appropriation of the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, 1E Rapid Response Grant, PY21, Intergovernmental Agreement Number 21-651006, Company 5000, Accounting Unit 2840, for $500,000. Second. Thank you. Will you please call the roll? Can you do a voice vote? Oh, we can. A voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I move to approve item 8B, FIR 0153-23, approval of issuance of payments by DuPage County to various training providers through the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, 1E Rapid Response Grant, P121, Intergovernmental Agreement, number 21-651006, in the amount of $328,000. We have we've moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes. Um, and now to the fun part, the presentation. I think it might not be super fun. Oh, I think it's fun. I hope it's fun. Drum roll, please. Yeah. May we present Lisa Schumann. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, economic woman. Um, it's wonderful to see you all. So Today, I'm going to be giving a sort of wrap up of our program year 22 grant. You, typically, I don't get too into the nuts and bolts of everything, um, you know, to a certain extent and kind of just try to cover initiatives and things like that. But today, it's going to be a little bit more of the nitty gritty of our grant management that, and then I'll let you know what our program year 23 allocation is, um, which we're actually pleasantly surprised about. So um, if you want to advance to the first slide. So uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA, as you know, is the federal legislation that funds everything that we do at WorkNet. It's also um, considered, it's represented in the federal government as Title I funding. So if you ever hear Title I, that's, or Title I-B, that's us. Um, program year 22, so our program year always runs July 1 through June 30, so we're at the very tail end of program year 22 right now. So I'm going to give a synopsis on that today. 
every year we get three formula fund grants. So those are decided by a formula as the title suggests. So that means I pleasantly do not need to write for those grants specifically. Um, we get allocated a certain percentage of funds every year from the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. Um, those are the dislocated worker grant. So people that are eligible for those grants were laid off from their jobs. They were eligible for or collected unemployment. The 1A grant is the adult grant, and we spend every program year at least 75%, but it's typically more around 90 to 95% of that grant on people who are income eligible. And then our 1Y youth grant is for 16 to 24 year olds. We're required typically to spend at least 75% of that on out of school youth. Um, and then there's also income eligibility and, and or specific barriers that are attached to eligibility for that. We've talked about that a bit in these committee meetings that the youth eligibility. So for program year 22, you can see our total allocation there was about $4.9 million. And then for each grant, um, what those dollar amounts were. And we can, we can provide this presentation if you'd like to the entire committee, you know, just for reference. Um, this past year, we also had national dislocator, dislocated worker grants. We had three of those. Those I did need to write for. Um, and we were awarded three different national dislocated worker grants. Those are all basically either wrapped up or wrapping up right now. So those will be off the books for this upcoming year. And then every year we also have the trade adjustment assistance program, which is a totally different program from WIOA, but we administer that as well. That's for individuals who were laid off due to foreign competition. So if the jobs were outsourced or things of that nature, people can qualify for that specific program. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so, so for program year 22, so every year with the grant management of this, um, we have to spend or obligate at least 80% of each of those three grants within the first year of the grant. So you can carry over a maximum of 20% per year. So you can see where we're at this year. Our 1A, so again, that income eligibility has been off the charts. We have had tremendous amounts of people that we are serving through that grant. Um, it's been really remarkable. So as you can see, we are overspent on that grant. We are underspent on the 1D dislocated worker grant. As you all know, unemployment currently in DuPage County is in like the 2.5 to 2.8% range, which is really unheard of. Um, and then the youth grant, we are at 87%. So we're already you know, past the required threshold for that. We do have a budget modification in place with DCEO right now that will move some of those 1D funds to 1A and rectify that in balance. Um, but we're you know, definitely where we need to be. Next slide, please. The other requirement annually um, for these dollars is that at least 50% of the 1A and 1D grants need to be spent on direct training activities for job seekers and businesses. So as of the end of May, you can see there where we're at. Total, we are at almost 67% which I will go ahead and kind of toot our own horn on this. There are other workforce areas in the state that are trying to lobby to get like a waiver in place because they can't hit the 50%. Um, we are way above, like way above. And that's not even counting everything that we potentially could count towards this. So what that means is we are running a pretty lean and streamlined operation um, where most of those dollars are going towards, you know, job seeker and business activity. That number will be lower next year because we did have rent abatements in place this year that kind of reduced our overhead costs. But that's something that we're extremely proud of that most of the dollars that go out are going to job seekers or to businesses. There's really two main activities that are direct training activities. And I'm going to talk about those now if you want to advance to the next slide. So this is a breakdown of the training vouchers. Those individual training account training vouchers where we fund people's education, that's the primary training activity for job seekers naturally. That's our bread and butter. So through the end of May, um, this is the occupational mix of skills that we've invested in, in in the local workforce. You can see the top one with over 205 vouchers issued was in the TDL and um, specifically also the CDL licenses. 962,000, this is a provision test, $962,319, um, almost you know, approaching a million dollars there for the TDL sector. 
And as you guys know, we work really closely with our partners at Choose to Page. We've had many conversations about how important the TDL industry sector is to our local economy and regional economy. So we're definitely, you know, the job seekers are aligning themselves with where that demand is in the TDL sector. Um, in second place there, you can see 156 vouchers were issued for IT and business management or business analysis. And then manufacturing and trades was in third place, which um, was nice to see because we all know there's a huge need in that sector as well. Um, 453,000 there. Healthcare approaching 200 vouchers written um, for 385,000. Many of those students might be at College of DuPage, which is why their vouchers are spread out over time and the cost might be a little bit lower than some of those condensed programs. Lisa, is that number less than what you've been seeing as far as a trend in healthcare? Healthcare, I would say this program year, healthcare and manufacturing and trades kind of flipped. Usually the manufacturing and trades would be a little lower than it's been and healthcare would kind of be in that third place area. Okay. Um, traditionally, IT and business management analysis, sort of the executive level or IT training was always the top in DuPage County until the past maybe three years or so where TDL overtook it. Um, which is really interesting, but it aligns with everything that's happening in our economy. Um, it's, it's switching. Professional and business services is going like this as far as job openings, and TDL is going like this. Um, we were just talking about that at the Chief to Page strategic planning meeting. So, but yes, healthcare is in fourth place, which is a little surprising. Um, it's a little surprising, but maybe post COVID, not all that surprising, right. you know? So, um, and then you see at the bottom there, other professional. So those top four are the key industry sectors that we always focus on. That's our local, regional, and state planning sectors. The bottom one is sort of the catch-all for things like admin, HR, graphic design, other things that we fund. Um, and you can see 136 vouchers were issued there. So the direct training dollars for job seekers, this is the bulk of it right here. For businesses, if you want to advance to the next slide, please. You guys are very familiar on the Economic Development Committee with the incumbent worker training grants because those come through this committee uh, for informational purposes. This is a summary of that program. Um, 23 new grants were awarded to local businesses this program year for a total of just over 200 trainees that were covered through those grants. Uh, total funds awarded there approaching 300,000. Five of those projects were apprenticeship projects, which is an area of increasing emphasis for us. And then you can see the sector breakdown. Manufacturing was the bulk. Um, there were healthcare and social services that was actually Easter Seals and um, Edward, uh, Edward Almhurst Healthcare, and then five IT projects as well. So that's the breakdown of the incumbent worker. Um, if you want to advance. So who did we serve? Um, I, I included two charts here for race, ethnicity of our PY22 registrants. So you could see this program year, 55% of new registrants. Registrants are individuals that we fully enroll in our programs. Typically, they're people that are receiving the training vouchers. We serve the general public. We serve people that don't end up on a case manager's caseload. Um, but these are people that are actually being case managed. 55% white, identify as white. Um, you could see people that identify as black, 30%. 14% Hispanic, Latino. Um, Asian uh, identified 11%, and then small segments for, for the other categories. Um, we're always pretty proud of how this has actually been trending in what I would deem the really correct direction, because the overall demographics of DuPage County, um, the minority group, the primary minority groups of DuPage County are typically at or overrepresented the overall demographics of the county. So that to me tells us that we're really trending in the right direction with a lot of the DEI work that we've been doing at WorkNet to try to make sure that the services are accessible to everybody, that we're doing outreach into various communities, et cetera. So um, that's our chart for PY22. Male, female is still continues to be quite alarming. <laughs> Pre-COVID, that was always about a 50-50 split or 51-49% split. As you can see, that's the terminology in our case management system, male at birth, female at birth, is quite lopsided. Um, we are serving way more men than women at this point. And that's been the, the case for the past um, kind of post-COVID program years. So is that probably what we've seen is so many women were 
basically pushed out of the workforce due to COVID because they had you know stay home, um, take care of the kids and all that, and then have not re-entered the workforce. I and I I believe that that's the primary driver. Mm -hmm. Just sort of anecdotally, yeah. um, that's what I would attribute it to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. I mean, it, it's it's been remarkable just just how lopsided it's gotten. Mm -hmm. Although in recent months, it's starting to kind of like even out mm -hmm. for whatever reason. But yeah, that for the entire program year, that's a pretty wide uh, gap. So. Is, has there been any um, specific intentional reach out to basically working moms or moms who used to work previously outside the home? So glad you asked. Stay tuned. Rehearsal. Yeah. Stay tuned. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, the, let's let's put a pin in that. Okay. Okay. That. okay. Um, if you want to advance to that cruise through the rest of these slides, so. Internally, we designated a couple of strategic goals. These we did not report out on. We don't report out on this to DCEO or Department of Labor. But internally, part of our DEI work is as a staff, we identified two specific goals um, to increase the number of new English language learner registrants and to increase the number of new registrants with the criminal offense, also sometimes referred to as second chance. Um, employment. So for target, the target for PY22 I set was 48, which would be a one third increase over the prior program year. If you want to click the mouse there, hopefully this works. My animation. <laughs> 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 um, so the actual what we ended up as of as of you know basically the end of May was at 77. So wow. we far outstripped, and a lot of that was due to the um, Ukrainian refugees that we mm. served. But even that included, that is um, a really significant number there. So we already passed up the, the target that I had set for this coming program year. So I'll have to recalibrate that perhaps. Um, but yes, we did really strong work in this area this year. And then increase the number of uh, people with a criminal offense. We set a target of 27, which would be a 20% increase over the previous year. And we ended up at... 31. So we already passed that as well. And that's without the month of June factored in. Um, so so we've, we're achieving our goals internally. That's a testament to the team at WorkNet. Um, just, you know, an amazing group of, of professionals there. The third thing has been um, really important to me and to all of us is really reinvigorating the in-person activity and associated core, what they call core services at the center. And many of you have been out to our events and seen the center and seen the activity going there. We have had over a 70% increase from the previous program year in services received actually at the center. So that's been numerous types of activities, including um, partnerships again with, with agencies like Choose DuPage. We had the Connect uh, DuPage event there on Friday, which was well attended. One of the attendees said to let you know that it was very impactful. That was the specific yes, word she wanted. Word. So it's it's not only job seekers; it could be businesses, it could be um, you know all sorts of different events going on there. But we're really striving to make it a hub and really get people engaged in the process of job search, rather than you know the little boxes and kind of listening to a webinar in the background. Um, we feel it's more effective, so we're really pleased with that result. Uh, the next slide. This is our program year 23 allocation. As you can see at the top there, we got a $253,590 increase. That increase, ironically, sits at the 1D level, which as we were talking about, we're not seeing that many 1D people, we're seeing 1A people where we got a slight decrease. So Carmi here, um, my invaluable esteemed colleague from our finance mm -hmm. department, who tip up the cap to her, she does just outstanding work on managing all these grants. Um, yeah, the behind the scenes players that are the absolute essential, you know, everything. So um, what we're doing is we are shifting a chunk of that 1D money to 1A naturally right at the beginning of the year. Um, and then the 1E grant that you all just approved and accepted kind of fills the gap of what I'm moving from 1D to 1A. So it's a puzzle, but mm -hmm. I try to make sure that all of our grants every year remain basically stable or a slight increase. And if we have a decrease, I write for additional grants. Um, so that 1E grant is going to do that. We're also gonna still have trade adjustment. I currently submitted an application for apprenticeship expansion. I mentioned apprenticeships. Um, it's a small grant, but it's really to drive an effort to get more companies to adapt those types of models. And then there's a couple other things in the works. We might be seeing some money depending on 
um, how things play out through the energy efficiency <laughs> conservation block grant. I know some of you are on that committee, I think a public works committee that was discussed at the last public works meeting. Um, and then there's a ton of funding around uh, clean jobs. So we'll see where that plays out. Yeah. But that's our allocation for uh, program year 23. And then I think I have one more slide. I do not, but I, I didn't put them on slide. Oh. <laughs> I want to also note that uh, Member Glassy has been um, really, really bringing that issue to the forefront of moms that left the workforce to raise kids and maybe have been out for an extended period of time or left during COVID or any, anywhere in between. So we're working in conjunction with Eric Finney from Choose DuPage as well as the College of DuPage to launch a series of programs. We're gonna kind of go with like a back to school, back to work kind of theme. It's gonna kick off in September. It'll be a series of workshops that are addressing mom's concerns, anxieties, you know, I'm outdated, um, everything from that to like, how do I put a resume together and address this gap? I've never used Microsoft Teams before in the office place. All of those types of things we're going to try to touch on in this series and start pulling moms back into the workforce, even in part-time capacities. I love that. I'm always looking for, you know, as mom, mom friendly mm -hmm. options. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the biggest thing that mothers Always struggle with this child care. Yeah, absolutely. Kindergarten, there's some kindergartens that are half days, some are full days. And when they're trying to look for a job that um, coincides with you know, their kids' schedules, it, yep. it's difficult. So, does working at DuPage also um, apply for grants? Possibly. I don't know if the state still does this, but they, I think they covered child care expenses before, a long time ago, under a different administration. I don't know if they still have that program. So there is the program that's called CCAP, or naturally it's an acronym, um, Child Care Assistance Program, CCAP. And it's administered for DuPage County through the YWCA. So we refer people to YWCA. There's an income eligible, I don't know the 100% of the eligibility requirements, but there's an income eligibility requirement. If somebody's out of work, if they're job searching, um, if they're in an occupational training program, they can qualify for that assistance. So we refer, we connect everybody into YWCA. That being said, we put out um, feelers in moms groups um, online for different communities just to kind of see like, is there an appetite for this before we go ahead and like build some kind of programming out? We got within the first day, we had 41, 48 responses. Um, and many of them mentioned childcare. It's more complicated than one would think because you don't want to set up childcare and start paying for childcare before you land the job. Right. But if you land the job and don't have the childcare, then there's a delay. So um, it's definitely a huge issue. I don't, I'm not sure 100% what the answer is. Where we, I put a survey together, we're going to be sending out to businesses to start to construct an uh, mom friendly or parent friendly um, employer list with questions such as, you know, do you provide, there's some kind of flexible spending account that some employers, I guess, can provide for childcare. Um, I'm kind of learning about this on the fly through my you know, work from home. Remote <laughs> options, precisely. Do you offer like, you know, job sharing? Do you offer part-time hybrid? So that because many of the moms were like, it would be really nice to have a list of employers. And we're like, well, we have a ton of employers we can ask. So we're in the process of, um, I'm finalizing kind of a survey and then we're going to send that out to all of our collective contacts. Um, so we have things in the works and I'll certainly keep the committee, you know, updated on this. Was that, do you, any of your grants cover that effort? They do not. No. So that's money that's coming out of your budget. Well, besides my time so far, there hasn't been any costs associated with it, but staff, I'm sort of, donating some time to it. I, I feel like sometimes there's a disconnect between, you know, why can't we help more moms You're right, than yeah. the OA monies, all the money You're you right. And, and that, you can talk to that a little bit. That is true um, because we are, we're workforce development, but we administer those programs and those programs pay for all of our staff hours. Every penny of it, as you guys know, we don't, we don't take general um, funds from the county. It's everything is supported by the federal grant. So if you stray kind of too far outside of activity that is part of those grants, 
you're not really supposed to do that, right? You're supposed to be spending your time on these grants and that's how our time is allocated on our timesheets and so forth. So a project like this, I mean, I can put, I can make the argument that it's kind of core services or, you know, but um, sometimes things come along and we're like, we don't have the staff, like I can't put like a team of career counselors on this because they're busy doing all that other stuff. So um, we kind of have to pick and choose. Yes. Um, thank you. I just wanted to commend you and your team because um, Lisa and I had kind of brainstormed about this mom's going back to work idea back in like April or yeah. March. Or like, yeah. And they have just done a tremendous job of running with this. And, you know, I just love the idea that you had of putting this out on social media. And she shared with me all the comments that we got. And it was, you know, pretty apparent that there was definitely an appetite in the in the county for something like this. And I, I know personally, I, I, that's kind of the sense I was having when, you know, I had been a stay-at-home mom for so many years. And um, also partnering with the, with the businesses to see who will be mom-friendly and who will, you know, I think it's just going to make it a, a great synergy. And I'm really, really, you know, excited and just been very delighted with how you guys handled this initiative. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a partnership. Like I said, Choose DuPage, uh, College of DuPage and, and myself have been working on this to date and we'll see if we even fold in, you know, some more partners as we go. So I'm excited about it too. And I think employers are going to learn what moms need yeah. mm -hmm. and that, you know, linkage is going to be really important. Mm -hmm. um, I thank you for bringing this up and championing it. This is something near and dear to my heart. I started a, a group for women leaders in Glen Ellen for working moms. Because oh, yeah. I felt like that just wasn't, there was like this whole group of women who were working outside the home. We didn't have anything like this. So we did it and we helped each other, resumes, interviewing, just supporting and all that kind of thing. So I, yeah, this that's is one of more of my yeah, passion. Good, because we're gonna need it's, it's, passionate people to help yeah. out. <laughs> you, know, you need help. Yeah. yeah. Women have to help women there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. any kind of resources or groups like that, yes. you know, so I, have that. That. I have a big one. And then the other thing I would love to suggest is if you could, in terms of the outreach, and if there's any way we can help, knowing what you're saying about the limits of the grant and, mm -hmm. and work and dividing up labor, um, to target elementary schools, mm. junior highs, the high schools, because that's where, you know, okay, all my kids are in school now. Now I can possibly you start working it. again. The digital backpack is what we're going okay, to try to do. Yay. Um, okay. all of our, all of our, all of us with kids in school yes, know no, you no. get all those emails. <laughs> so we're going to try to use those that digital okay, backpack perfect. system with this back. This we actually put it together last year. My marketing person oh, and I, wow. but we didn't end up getting to it. Um, okay. But back to school, back to work, kind of like some fall leaves, yes. and, you know, and then really push this this series because yes. I think so and much of it. What I come to help you with that as well. Yeah, Wonderful. yeah. So much of what I encountered was women who were just intimidated to take that first step. That's a lot of what we were hearing. Yeah, that's yeah. like seemed to be. And then once they found out, wait, I can do this and have support and help. Whew, it's a confidence. Store. It's a yeah. confidence issue. It's it is a skills issue to a degree, but really the big thing is the confidence I agree. and knowing that's what to expect. Right. A job search is much different than oh. it was ten years mm -hmm. ago. Definitely, definitely. Yes. Sorry, one more quick question. And your presentation was amazing. Do you? And I know this is hard to like pinpoint, but do you have a way to quantify the amount of people that you help? Annually, and I know that's like a hard question, but uh, it is a hard question. Yeah. Um, I can tell you right now, I was anticipating. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, right now we have active on case managers' caseloads, we have 500 people. Okay. They exit, they enter, there's churn naturally. Sure. People get jobs, they get exited, and then new people are always applying. Right. Um, but the total figures is much more complex because, as you know, people come in and they're using, we do check in various services, um, and I do track some of the numbers, but I don't know that it's 100% accurate. But based off of check-ins, I could pull something and we could, we could get a rough estimate. And it depends on what you're defining as a service. Right. The state defines as a service or referral, for example. So if someone comes through us, we give them a referral to IWCA or we give them a referral that might be what they needed. Mm -hmm. Those get counted, but not 100%. So, I mean, there's so much activity. It's it's somewhat hard to quantify. Yeah, yeah. I but I can come up with a rough kind of okay. figure. Remember you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back to the CCAP and the child care assistance yeah. payments. So um, I noticed that my clients, it would take this very, very long delay for them to get reimbursed for child care from the state, from DHS, all of those things. And I was wondering if there's any consideration 
that um, WorkNet would be would it be able to have a fund to be reimbursed by CCAP at a later date, but to have that money readily available for those mothers who immediately get jobs, because sometimes those payments they are two months behind, right? Um, and so I'm just wondering if there's a way to shorten that process so that um, we can really help mothers get employment and childcare at the same time. I love that nugget of information you share because I didn't know that that it runs. It's not surprising to me, but I guess I hadn't thought about it, that it would run late like that. We have the ability to provide supportive services with our dollars. We don't typically do childcare for a number of reasons. We probably don't have time to even go into. If they were enrolled with us, if they were on a caseload, we can only issue payments for people that are on a caseload. So if we serve them, they're on somebody's caseload, they get a job, they're receiving CCAP. I would love to be able to write that into our supportive service policy where we can somehow issue the, the, the one money. trick to it is I'm not sure about the allowability of yeah. issuing a payment to an individual. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we're allowed to do that with or the even just to do the payment directly to the daycare or the child care place. Mm -hmm. We'd have to look into it. Yeah. And the reason being, and I don't know how much time we have, but the, I'm sorry, Teresa. The, oh, yeah. The um, one of the items that you approved today was for payments to training providers, for example. So that all gets approved through multiple levels. Like we can't just issue a voucher to anybody that starts up a school in their house or whatever, right? So it's all so with the child care provision, there would have to be like a list of approved vendors. Yeah. I'm guessing, right? And we can so, do like a set aside money and like borrow money and then eventually somebody will reimburse. We cannot do that. Yeah. yeah. It's worth exploring, but I think we've talked about this. If there was a list like there is for training providers of child care providers that would accept our type of funding, then potentially, but it doesn't, it wouldn't be able to cover everything. So like a stay at home, like an at home child care, I'm not sure if it's allowable. Or even um, like what we had brainstormed about reaching out to companies that are mom friendly, like maybe certain childcare facilities would be willing to let someone use their services for a month and then know that they're going to get reimbursed once the support comes in. Yeah. If that person retains the job. Yeah. Yeah. Then the company's taking the risk of if the person well, fails on the childcare. Yeah, out of their pocket, right? Yeah, it's a it's a tricky, yeah, it's tricky really issue. So let's look into this later because I think we, in the interest of time, we have yeah. to move forward. But um, this is something that we could further discuss. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And um, if we'll we'll send through the slides in case okay. people want those for for reference. Okay. okay. Thank, right. you for your Thank, you, Thank you, Lisa. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Up you. next. Teresa O'Brien with Choose to Page. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, members, members, I'm filling Thank you for Greg Bella today. I'm a little shorter and a little bit more hair. <laughs> a lot more hair. I um, wanted to do a really, really brief recap of the regional business outlook, which was Thursday, June 8th, almost two weeks ago already, um, at Drury Lane in Oak Brook, which is traditionally where we've held this. We did have 590. 509 people in attendance. So we are creeping our way back to pre-pandemic numbers. Um, last year, attendance was 407 people. So this was great that we're, we're there. And the year before the pandemic, it was 622. So we're really not that far off. So we're excited about that. And Howard Tolman was the keynote in 2019. So I think he was a big draw. Um, just kind of wanted to recap quickly. I know a lot of you were there. I won't go into many details, but Chair Conroy spoke first and kind of kicked it off speaking about the county and really the resiliency of the county in rebounding from the pandemic, talking about employment being strong. Um, she touched on the formation of the Greater Chicago Land Economic Partnership or GSEP, um, the elimination of the county fee impact or county impact fee program. And then again, talked about improving mental health services and about the high housing affordability crisis. And I think that was really great. I think people really enjoyed hearing that much from the county chair or uh, chair with the county board. And then Kara Esser from Mesereau is an economist. She spoke more globally um, and had really good information. I um, appreciate the way that she presents it in an understandable fashion. But what was funny to me is after all this data and information, she kind of boiled it down to the end as 
we've got mixed signals. There's the good, which was, and I had to put these in notes, the equity market in the US remains optimistic. Bond yields are high relative to the last two decades. Compared to peer nations, the US doesn't look so bad. The bad, the market expects the Fed, the Fed to cut rates by the end of the year. The US dollar is weakening and sentiment in general is negative. So she was kind of like, it's really mixed signals at this point. But, but I think she was more positive than negative. Um, and then Tim Crane from um, Wintrust, he's the CEO of Wintrust. He was back for a second year in a row. And I thought his presentation was great. Um, in his opinion, there's a likelihood of a recession, at least technically, he says. And in fact, many, some industries are really already feeling it, but it's going to be spotty, he thinks. Nothing, you know, kind of gloom and doom. Um, he talked a little bit about labor and unemployment, supply chain issues. One thing I really thought was interesting, he spoke about the bank crisis, and he really compared what's happened recently with the few bank failures to the 2008 situation, and they're very different. Um, happened much more quickly in this case, and a lot of that had to do with social media and word getting out and people panicking, and he had a chart, and I can't remember now the numbers, but the length of time it took with the other situation was very different. And so he felt like what we've seen is not going to continue. Something like four weeks versus four hours. Yes. Yeah. Thank oh. you. Yeah. The, in terms of the word getting out. Mm -hmm. So, and it was, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. and he talked about the dissemination of misinformation that there's all this information out there, but it's not all accurate. But people are making their decisions based on bad information. Um, he touched a little bit on crypto and AI, didn't get into a lot of detail on that. Um, and then Michael Fosnack, who is um, like Greg's equivalent with World Business Chicago, and he's also the marketing, chief marketing officer of the city. Um, he just sort of talked a little bit about that whole idea of regional collaboration and cooperation with respect to business attraction and retention. Um, and the newly formed GSEP. So that was great to have him. And there was a brief panel discussion. And I was very proud to say we were done by 9.29. And we thought we say we go to 9.30. Um, so I thought it was good. And we've gotten really good feedback. We did survey everyone um, pretty much immediately. And what one thing that came out of it, and I haven't seen all the results yet, but one thing that came out is 40% of the people there had never attended before. Oh, so I thought wow. that was great that we're reaching new people too. And um, I think as our email list has grown and a lot of it coming from like the grant program, um, when we did the reinvest in page grant program, I think we have a broader and more diverse group of people that we're reaching, which is great. So that's all I've got. Did anyone have any questions? Um, I don't have. Does anyone have any questions? It was a wonderful yeah, event. Yeah. Great, great event. Thank you to those yeah. of you that were here. Too. Yeah, so it was thank wonderful. You. Thanks for all your work that you put sure. into it. Thank you, Teresa. Um, great presentations. Thank you very much, everyone. Do we have any old business? Seeing none. Do we have any new business? Seeing none. Um, with that, I move to adjourn until our next meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.